afternoon. My name is Alice. I'm an obstetric trainee and I'm also the trial coordinator for the Cradle 4 trial, which looks at timing of delivery for preeclampsia in a low and middle income setting, specifically India and Zambia. This afternoon, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the work that I've been doing around that trial, looking specifically at how we go about translating recruitment materials that are used for maternal health research studies. So just to remind you of some of the key principles of informed consent, someone needs to have capacity to give consent, they need to be doing so voluntarily, and crucially, they need to have been provided with sufficient comprehensible information. And it's that comprehensible aspect of the informed consent process that I'm focusing on in this study. Some of the issues that have been identified by um, academics over the years looking at the informed consent process in low and middle income countries relate to the fact that a lot of these um, trial materials, so participant information leaflets and consent forms, are written and designed in English in a high income setting and they're really designed to suit the needs of the funder and the sponsor and although they may follow ethical procedures, in practice, um, they're often not actually serving the purpose um, that they are designed to do. And the complex medical legal language that is used is often not understood by potential participants. And this is compounded by low levels of literacy um, that are often found in, in many of the settings where global health research takes place. And the result of this, um, as identified by this paper in 2014, is that a huge number of research participants, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, um, hadn't been provided with appropriate information to enable them to understand the key domains of informed consent. And some of the specific issues encountered were things like therapeutic misconceptions, so believing that by taking part in a trial, you would receive a direct benefit yourself, and um, the fact that taking part is voluntary, and also some key research terms such as randomization and placebo. So how does all of this relate to preeclampsia and why we're here today? Preeclampsia justifiably attracts an, an enormous amount of maternal health research, and a lot of that is again justifiably focused in low and middle income countries. Um, but we need to remember as we go about this research that these are very vulnerable women in vulnerable healthcare systems, and so we really need to make sure that the procedures that we have in place are appropriate um, for the settings where we're working. So this study was born out of some of our early experiences with Cradle 4 and a number of issues that we identified as we tried to translate some of our recruitment materials. So for many words, there simply wasn't an equivalent term in the local language. Um, and the other issue that came up was a real lack of familiarity with the written version of the local language. So um, in Zambia since 1966, English has been the primary language of instruction in schools. And so whilst people may be very fluent um, speaking and, and listening to um, Bembo or Nyanja, some of the local languages here, um, often these are predominantly oral languages um, and people aren't actually able to understand written versions. So you may produce a beautifully translated document, but again, it doesn't actually serve the purpose that you want it to. And this is just an example, this quote um, of something that really did get lost in translation. And we were trying to say that there'd be no financial compensation for taking part, but it turns out that the word for money in funerals is really very similar. And it just shows that um, a very simple um, misunderstanding can totally distort the meaning of a sentence. So what I wanted to do was to look at which terms occurred most frequently, look at how those might be translated and what the barriers to um, appropriate and adequate translation might be, and then how we might counter that. So, so far, um, I've done a content analysis um, of a variety of, of different uh, research materials that have been used in preeclampsia research studies um, across a variety of different countries um, within Africa. Um, and we had a fascinating workshop um, bringing together researchers, social scientists, language teachers and translators um, in Lusaka in Zambia um, and started a, a sort of iterative process of thinking about how you might go about translating some of these frequently occurring terms and it really highlighted um, the difficulties so 
a word like risk may be translated in a variety of different ways, depending on how the translator decides to interpret it. Um, again, proteinuria, there's no equivalent term for, and so you end up with a very lengthy explanation that ultimately doesn't make sense to anybody. So the next steps is to conduct some more in-depth interviews with key informants based within Zambia um, and to try and develop and standardize some key terms and phrases relating to maternal health research and specifically preeclampsia research in the local languages, initially here in Zambia and then hopefully further afield, and to conduct some community focus group discussions to then explore how those terms are understood um, and whether we've got it right. And ultimately, I hope that this will enable us to develop informed consent materials that are fit for purpose, to strengthen our own research capacity and that of our collaborators, and to bridge this gap between ethical procedures and then actually putting those ethics into practice. And then finally, of course, working with APEC International um, to produce and disseminate educational resources in a wider variety of languages once we've established um, what those, those key terms and phrases might be. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much, of course, to the Walker Edmund Scholarship for supporting this work.